action. Welcome to Crit Sandwich. This is the Q&A recap episode. My name is Casey Sears. With me tonight is Chuck Ventus. What's up? And Robbie Ponder. Hello. And Matt Popich. Hey. So thanks everyone for listening. And um, we will try to keep some of the season nine, campaign nine spoilers at bay. But we can't make any guarantees. So if you are not caught up, uh, go do that. Lots of Crit Sandwich there for you to listen to. You mean season 10? Well, this is the Campaign 9 recap. Oh, yeah. we're recording season 10 right now, Chuck. Yes, we are. This is, <laughs> this is coming. This episode, I know we just recorded episode uh, 5 th- of Campaign mm. 10. But this is the Q&A episode for Campaign 9 that's coming out maybe a week from when we're recording it. Um, so this will probably come out in... Sorry, I don't have a ca- I don't actually have a calendar right next to me. That would have been sweet. Nor, nor can I add yeah, 20 uh this should be coming out March 23rd. It's uh March 16th right now here in the real world. Happy St. Patrick's Day everybody. Oh yeah. My kids made uh leprechaun traps today at school. Wow, did you kill any leprechauns? <laughs> Why would you kill them? You don't traps? kill them. You trap it's pretty them inhumane. to get their gold. Well, they're making traps. Well, I, what do I you do with them? That. <laughs> Some uh you put, you make a box, yeah, and then you put gold in it, and they try to get the go- the fake gold, and then you trap them, and then you get real gold from trapping them. You don't kill them. Don't they already have gold? Why would they want? Yeah, you're trying to get yeah. their gold. Yeah, because they've been hoarding it all. Right. Oh. They're like dragons. They want more gold always. So you all have, uh, you listeners have written in, and have sent us some questions. And we are going to read those and answer them for you. So we're going to start off with a question from Kayla that says, Howdy guys, happy to participate in your second round of Q&A and so far loving Robbie's rendition of Jumanji. She's about halfway through at this point. The cocaine segment had me in tears. You guys are so lawful good. That is true. I am actually in my own life. I'm lawful good unless it doesn't make sense. In which case, I, I will totally break. I'll break bad rules. Uh, sure. Like you cocaine don't, is a hell of a drug. Like you don't pay your taxes, <laughs> for example. Like you don't believe in that rule. Exactly. Right. Dumb rule. Yeah. Who needs it? Dumb rule. Robbie's big reveal in episode six literally gave me goosebumps. We're back to the email now. This isn't me. But it, it is also true of me. Robbie's big reveal in, there in episode six literally gave me goosebumps. He's been doing a fantastic job as DM with campaign nine. Thank you. It's funny because often I feel like I understand Robbie before the rest of your group does. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We need a Robbie interpreter for the rest of us on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, that would help us a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to what Kayla was saying. When he is maybe explaining something you didn't understand the first time, and I'm talking to the podcast like, come on, guys, Robbie's right. But it really adds to my and probably others' overall experience where I feel like I'm just watching a bunch of friends I know play a game of D&D. So, here are my questions. We're actually probably just going to answer this first question because the others are related. How does it feel to be on Campaign 10 already? Did you ever anticipate you would have this many chapters in your podcast series? How likely is it that we will get to Campaign 20? This is where you guys are supposed to throw me under the bus. Tear. I'm letting you throw yourself under the bus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so um i have been giving this a lot of thought and consideration and i'm so proud of all of the work we've done with crit sandwich i think we have 10 seasons seven of them are pretty freaking fantastic right i think we've done a really good job here i'm really proud of the show i won't say which seasons are my least favorite i, I i'll own it it's fine i <laughs> it's nine. the matt season i, I no, know <laughs> no, mathematically no, it has to be no. No, it's it's a couple of mine, honestly. It's a couple of mine. But we have we've had a I think we've had an amazing run of the show. We've done ten campaigns and I could not be more proud. And, you know, really going out there and just putting ourselves out there like that, really being vulnerable, really doing something amazing and special. 
and very public in a way that that I had not done before. But after 10 campaigns in three years, I am feeling creatively fulfilled, ready to move on to to new things. And I this I mean, this is all my fault. So everyone can blame me. So I said to the team before we started campaign 10 that I was ready to to move on from the show and me pulling that thread kind of pulled everything else apart. I th- it seems as if season 10 will be our last. It's all I think Casey. The, the real reason I, I saw Casey without <laughs> his winter jacket on and I said uh, he had weak biceps and he got mad. So that's the real that's reason that we're uh, There's a lot disbanded. <laughs> yeah, a lot of animosity from that. <laughs> No, I mean let's let's talk about it. Let's hash yeah. it out here, guys. Let's um let's be honest. You know, um I I you know when we started this show, I really, you know, hated my job back then. I thought, you know, maybe this would be in some ways a way out, but you know, things have changed and I also think the COVID times have been, you know, very stressful and a lot of work, but I think I'm ready to just not have a side hustle. I'm very comfortable and content in, in my work and in my career right now mm-hmm. and not having an additional deadline. I have a very deadline driven job and removing more computer work from my life, right? We this is all, you know, us in our basements or wherever we are in a closet right now in our attics, staring at computer screens, working on a project. Um I have an illustration and an art background. I haven't picked up my paintbrush or my banjo really since um we started doing this show. So I just, you know, I would like to work on some other things. And I do a lot of the editing and some of the heavy lifting on the show. Everyone else kind of felt, I mean, maybe don't let me speak for you guys, but it feels like no one else had time to step in to fill those positions. Nope. Yeah, I I would agree. Yeah, (laughs) Chuck works a ton. His job is pretty demanding as far as just pure time standpoint. And then I I have three kids and Robbie has two and Chuck has two as well, where it just is so monopolizing. Robbie already does so much for the podcast. So Robbie and Casey do, like Casey was saying, all the really heavy lifting. So there's just not much. It's just too big of a uh, hole to fill with what we have available to us. And honestly, I'm, I, I didn't protest much, Casey, because it, it, I'm not going to say it, it's a chore per se by at this point after years and years of this because I, I would like look forward to it and enjoy it. But just mm-hmm. just a constant like, OK, we have to meet up and on a certain day of the week to, to record. It got to feel I don't know if burdensome is necessarily the right word, because, again, I was very happy <laughs> to go and play. Yeah, but it's a big commitment. Yeah. Weekly for but months of, and years it, is a lot, you know. It, it is. It's a lot. Yeah. And we've worked our asses off to not miss a day, right? Yeah. If we say an episode's coming out, that episode comes out. Right. Mm-hmm. Holidays. Like if there's a holiday that week, it's like, all right, how are we going to shift it so that we can play? I feel like <laughs> I feel like potentially we were overly attempting to satisfy listeners to get it out on time because we didn't want to disappoint anyone. And maybe maybe that caused a little extra stress where it didn't need to be. Because, again, for clarity, for those of you out there like, oh, they made thousands of dollars they're fine (laughs) this was we lost we only yeah we we (laughs) never got one penny into the on the other side of the pnl it was only (laughs) it was only losses yeah and that's (laughs) and that's the thing where like we're we're at the point now where we like pivot and double down you know and i don't think any of us are ready to pivot and double down on the show right like i don't think any of us are ready to do the amount of merchandising, social media engagement, Patreon management, because that's a part-time job, right? The show already is a part-time job, and then it would be a much bigger part-time job if if we really um, uh, lean into it even harder. Yeah, and I agree with Casey. Like, I'm I'm very satisfied with the show. We've been doing it for three years. I mean, we've been publishing them for three years, but we've been playing together even longer than that because we did some practice recordings we even did a, a part of a campaign with Casey, but then we decided to scratch that and do the roll chart, which yeah. was, I feel was a very positive thing to oh, do. Definitely. I mean, I'm, it sucked that we lost all that work that Casey did into the other campaign, but picking up the roll chart, I think, was very awesome. For sure. And even before that, remember, we did my campaign with mm-hmm. Sabo, and you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, Brown, that was baby. long. Yeah. That was yeah. a long campaign. That <laughs> 
I remember Braun. That mm-hmm. one, we actually only <laughs> bought two mics at first, and like we were sharing them. Right. <laughs> And it sounded it did so not bad. Sound good. Yeah, yeah, it, it was sounded like, so horrible. Yeah, we learned a ton. I mean, we spent like two years just making audio mistakes, and we still didn't have like you know a pristine show when we first launched. Even now, we we uh, are I'm able to edit even better now because I used to only edit one one sound wave, but now I'm editing all four sound waves, which I think makes everything flow better and sound a lot better uh, when. Chuck sneezes when somebody's talking. I don't have to take out the whole sentence. I can just take out Chuck sneeze. Sneeze? I cough. I don't sneeze. I cough. Yeah, that actually brings <laughs> us to Kayla's second question, which turns out we did get to because I forgot these weren't all about future seasons. Despite still not playing in person, I feel that the production quality has increased, even with some of the goofy online issues you've encountered. You've noticed lots of little touches, and it really adds depth to your story. How have you adjusted to playing online, and what will change, if anything, if you guys are... Well, we'll actually, we'll, we'll skip that last part. Sorry. Uh, the current campaign that we're playing right now, I actually wear part of my outfit that my character wears. So <laughs> so they get to always see me uh, wearing something. Yeah, so Robbie, you want to talk about more about recording online? Yeah, sure. Uh, so recording online, Casey is the one that uh, found a program for us to use. And, and Casey sends me all the audio and I just take all four audios and I listen to it and I just edit. I don't I edit all four lines at the same time. But as I go through it, I take little chunks out here and there just to make it all sound smooth. And uh, after I edit all our voices, I hand it over to Casey and then Casey will put in the sound effects and the music, make everything like really flow really good. Yeah. So Robbie, uh, takes the, the initial four channel audio. We were always recording in one channel, right? So that's why you might've noticed that the, the production quality kind of went up is because we were, we were flattening everything into just one audio file. And sometimes you're kind of working with the lowest common denominator. Also, all of us were in the same room and, you know, all the mics are picking up a little bit of everybody else's. So it has been a lot more work recording remotely, but it has, you know, it has slowly and eventually after a whole lot of work, right? A whole lot of transition, a whole lot of thinking about how we're doing this, a whole lot of tweaking. We've tried, you know, multiple different online streaming platforms. We actually record over Discord. It's all kind of the same software, but there's a thing called Craig on Discord who will come into your call and set up a, he'll give you a little link that you can all uh, log into. So you're recording locally, but it's all happening kind of online. So that's how we're able, because you know, we talk over each other when we're recording the show, but Robbie does a really good job of making it not sound so much like that. Or if someone starts stepping over each other and you know, they, they kind of back off for a second, they can, you know, Robbie can remove that, um, that overspeak. And that helps a lot, right? That actually kind of makes it sound cleaner. Oh, definitely. I remember we used to say we edit lightly for brevity, but like that is gone. Like I, I, I think we do some, not so much heavy, heavy editing, but I, I feel our editing is like medium level. I think I've also gotten more confident with like just taking oh, shit definitely. out. That I think the last, you know, there was some stuff in that final episode of Campaign Nine where it was just really unnecessary. I have just, you know, discovered some better tools and some better methods for putting in the audio so it doesn't change as much. Actually, I've learned so much about audio. There's a part of me that wants to go back and remaster the early seasons. Oh. <laughs> uh, but also, that's a shit ton of work that's that I'm so saying I don't work. want to do anymore. So, I like, yeah. I'm trying to get out of this, right? <laughs> I know. I'm trying to get out of this. <laughs> I remember, too, when we were in the middle of the Bioshock camp campaign that's when we started that's when we switched to start recording remotely and i just remember like i think was the first two episodes i just complete i felt completely uncomfortable doing it like not in person and i was telling the guys like if we well in the uh episode zero for campaign nine i remember saying that i'm not going to be able to do this unless we meet in person but i now i feel like a lot more comfortable with it and i figured that out was because when i was talking in discord it was actually making me lag of what I was saying. So the microphone that the guys hear me on, they hear me on a different microphone than the microphone that I record on. It didn't pick up my first word. And so sometimes they didn't understand what I was saying. So it it felt really awkward for me when I would say something and like I would ask a question and like nobody answered it. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, that was hard. Yeah, we had, man, yeah, we've tried so many different things and made so many changes. And what we're doing now actually doesn't even work all the time because sometimes <laughs> the Craig's thing is down and uh, we use the back. They have like a backup that's just called on WeCaster. That is very, it's in beta right now. It's totally free. If you want to have good, high quality calls with people on, online and record them and edit them, it will give you just beautiful, rich uh, wave or AAC files. I like it a lot. I, I, they are not paying us any money or anything, but uh, they've been a damn lifesaver during during all this. Yeah, it sounds it sounds complicated, but I I don't, maybe it's not to me and Casey anymore, just because we've taken it one step at a time. But I don't think it's really that complicated. No, no, it's it's gotten. I I understand so much more now than I mean, you know, six, like six months ago, even a year ago. It, it's it's a constant learning process. And if anyone is, is curious about the recording things, I do. We do the on WeCaster links. I um, I clean up all the background noise and room noise in Adobe Audition. I run I run it through the Auphonic Leveler. Auphonic Leveler. That's a piece of software that kind of levels everyone, so we're all at the same volume ish. That's also a recent, more recent addition. That's one thing. I actually, if I just go back to the old episodes, it'll just to be run them run them through the leveler, get rid of the noise in a more sophisticated way than I used to. And then I edit everything again in Adobe Audition. Music is all coming from uh, open source stuff, things like that. And uh, it all it all slowly comes together. I'm glad people have been enjoying the quality. That is a thing that we always wanted and strove for was the quality. You know, we're also very, you know, amateurish too. So it's hard. Yeah. Our, th- our, th- our three main things were quality, that we're all having fun, and we're going to p- still put our family first. So. I think we, I think we did all those things to the best of our abilities, without a doubt. Oh, I agree, yeah. definitely. Chuck, do you want to read the second one called email query? Ooh, Kayla had another one. Did we? F- yeah, she has a couple Was more. It, on didn't there. she have one more saying? Is it the one we have you considered? Well, filming? have you ever considered filming a special? It's it's not things that we're going to do because the show's ending. The last uh, Hollywood true. calls us to uh, make a movie from one of our old campaigns. We'll be back. <laughs> we'll be like it's already a movie because we just ripped off the movie. We just yeah. did it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. So what am I doing? From Yolanda, the second one, email email query. query. I'll do it. Chuck's a fail. Hello. I all right. I fucking all right. Got you got it. it. I no, got I'm it. impressed. I didn't think you were gonna I get that. Go it. for it. <laughs> Hello. A question. This is from Yolanda, right? Hello. A question that intrigues me, but I haven't heard asked before is, how much does knowing the basis of the campaign's plot affect the way you build your characters? And does it change the way you enjoy the game? Do you, and then there's another kind of question on here. It's part of it. It's a two-parter. Do you feel you have a better idea of how the game might progress and end rather than playing a module or homebrew? Am I answering this first? or no, you're... <laughs> I've been talking a lot. So how about uh, Robbie or Matt? Y'all go for it. You Go, go ahead, Matt. You got it. <laughs> so I, I, so yeah. this is for like when you're... So for me, if I'm building a campaign... I, my goal is to not have an idea where I want it to end. Um, I want it to have multiple avenues to where it can end. And I want there to also to be avenues that I didn't even think of that if, if the crew comes up with something better then I need to be able to roll with it. I will say the exception of that was the chaos incarnate. I, I had a pretty good idea that it needed to end with a confrontation with, with the demon Lord. Now there were I had different scenarios from there, but and I, I this is they landed with the one that I wanted the most. So it it but it happened to roll that way. I didn't there was no picking. But it, like for with the dark elf one, that could have gone anywhere. Like I basically put them in a house and had what I knew was in the house and just let it go. And and they that I feel like they did a great job figuring out what they wanted to do and going with it. And and it ended up in what I thought was a cool ending with the characters, you know, one dying and one making it and one kind of not making it, but not really. So, I mean, for me, I think the the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons in general is that you don't like you, you set the stage and then let the actors act out however they want to play it um, and just kind of define it as you go. So that that's how it is for me, at least. But, but does knowing the plot affect how you build your character? We're talking about characters here. So on the flip side, <laughs> as a as a player, no, I I feel like I want to put, I feel like my character 
will get into a world and have that world affect the character. And then it's my opportunity as a role player yeah. to then say, okay, the world is doing this to me. What would my character do then back to the world? So I, I feel like that's more realistic, like in, like in real life, <laughs> that's how it would work in my mind. So that's how I want it to work in the game as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I, I agree with you because I mean, you just got to look at some of the examples. I mean, I campaign one where I was playing Reed Harpman and we get to the island and re- like, we don't know anything about monsters. So like basically we, we don't really know anything about the plot. Mm-hmm. And I also feel that we've had pretty good endings and it's because the dungeon master, he catered to the characters, which they worked together to make a great ending. Cause like for campaign nine, like I didn't really know uh, what the ending was going to be. I, you know, I set you guys up to work as a team and then I about halfway through the campaign. Then I was thinking of like Chuck's characters. He's William. He's looking after the other two because, you know, he's the grandfather. And so then I was like, you know what? If I gave him the opportunity, he would probably take the dark powers and he's very forgetful. So, I mean, why not, you know, let that him forget about the dark powers, which happened to work out really good. My answer to this is the plot does not affect how I build my character. My character is built based off of the character roles and the setting. That's how I build my characters. Now, I will say kind of knowing the plot of some of the movies like Die Hard, for example, I knew like there's one scene that comes to mind and it's right after 10 dies from the bookshelf and gets revived. We kill that guy in the hallway and he talks on his little uh, sending stone. I was like, dude, walkie talkie, John McClane, got to grab it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I grabbed it. So that, that was like a thing that I was like, oh man, I'm going to grab that and just kind of mess around with it and got to play with it. So yeah, I like to use um, when I'm building my characters, you know, I'll use the movie and like the actors and a lot of things for things like names. I'll use um, like we, when we did drow hard, I was like, oh, I got to be sneaky, right? Like that, I kind of knew that. And so I did a trickster cleric who, you know, specializes in stealth. You know, I, I definitely will let the my knowledge of the movie allow me to cheat a little bit when it comes to character creation. Uh, and then Yolanda also had one other part. So it is you guys might have already answered this, but uh, they were wondering if uh, we, in particular, if we find rolling for plots helps us integrate backstories or pick up traits, which you kind of just said, Casey. Yeah. Uh, that you feel more certain will come in handy. Yeah, I'm often kind of building things on the original source material. That's the secret, you know, the secret sauce of Crit Sandwich, right? Is we are gently borrowing from pre-existing things to to make something cool. And let me tell you, that's a lot less work than starting from scratch. That's it. <laughs> that's all the questions. Uh, where are the next ones at? Uh, Robbie, do you want to read the third one just titled Questions from Shane? So I'm not in this thing that you guys are in. Are you in an email? I'll read it. Hey, guys. I'm a huge fan. Matt. My questions are, (laughs) this is from Shane. Shane says, what would be your dream scenario to play on a season? As in, if you didn't have to roll for all the stuff, what characters, setting, and plot, what would you do? I wanted to do another zombie campaign in like a World War II area. On the world chart, the world builder chart, I started adding uh, like World War II movies on there, like Hearts War. If you guys ever watched that, that's a really good movie. There's an, like I was when I was in the army, I was on a tank. So there's another movie. Uh, I can't freak, I don't remember what it is, but it, like uh, Dick Tracy, I think would be awesome. But I like doing like a, an investigator movie would be kind of hard to put into a podcast. Uh, Casey really wanted to do Trolls too. He really wanted to Hell do Trolls Hell yeah, that's too. about what I was just to say. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, you so... know, if we are doing... Because here's the thing, guys. Even though Crit Sandwich is ending, that does not mean we are done playing D&D, right? The four of us are going to keep playing some games, right? We might... It's going to be a bit more casual, and you know, we might do some old-fashioned dungeon crawls or modules or something, right? But it's just not going to be for an audience. And if you, you guys know, if I do a campaign, I, there's going to be some Troll 2 in there. Man, that would be a great campaign, I think. I also really love the idea of doing Mega Man. I think that would be really fun, right? It's a lot of fights. 
and those fights lead to items and upgrades that lead to other fights. But, you know, you generally get to choose which which direction you're going. It's actually a lot of the th- ideas I had for the Mega Man campaign are kind of coming into play for um, yeah, campaign should 10. be similar. Yeah, I'm excited for Trolls mm-hmm. too. I have been dying. And uh, <laughs> so there's a show called The Hollow on Netflix, and it is an amazing story. There's two seasons now. Uh, it's a cartoon. And I watched it and I was like, I, it, with my son, um, I don't just watch cartoons. It's a six year old. <laughs> In any case, it's okay. Lie. You can watch cartoons as right. an adult. Well, like- this, uh, it, I mean, it starts out you, the three of you would wake up in a blocked in room with bricks all around you, um, not knowing where you are and how you got there. You would not be making character sheets at all prior to the session. It would just be like you wake up and then it, you just go from there. And that's how the the show starts, and they you have to figure out how you got there, why you're there, what your goal is. I just had this all in my mind. I have it all fired up, ready to go. And on multiple occasions, I was like, "Hey, I've got this thing. You guys want to try it?" And there was just zero. <laughs> there was nothing. You guys say zero start. interest. Hey. Like we just like it was tough, you're, you're but now first, we can do man. it. Now yeah, we can you're do first it. on the rotation. Right. Uh, oh man, I Mary, it came on the other day, and Mary Beth and I were watching it, and she, I was like, "Oh, I have this idea to do it as an Dungeons and Dragons." She was like, "Oh my god, that sounds like so much fun!" And she's never played Dungeons and Dragons, so it's it. I'm I have high hopes. So I don't really know like characters and settings and stuff. I think like bounty hunters came up at one point for characters. I thought that would have been cool at some point, but there was one plot that I don't even know. I don't think any of us knew like how to do it, but I would love to play in a game of this plot uh, from the movie Memento. Oh yeah, that would be the you just gosh, you yeah, be the one that amazing, amazing, but, yeah, How do you do golly. that? <laughs> how do you do that? I don't, I don't even know how you do it, but like, I just think that would be really cool because that's kind of like well, you have zero knowledge of like what's going on, but you pick up clues as it goes, and then you're like, oh shit, and then you kind of yeah, you have that twist at the end. You can do that with cinema, but I, man, I'd have to, I, I have not seen that movie in a, a, well over a decade. Neither I need I, to rewatch but... that and just, and think about what that would be like, but it sounds impossible. Very difficult. Uh, the one that we did where we had an idea and over and over it got picked. I still think there's, I still have hopes for that is where I forget the movie. I forget, I think it's Tom Cruise where like, basically he's got, it's kind of a Majora's mask esque in that. Like you go somewhere and then you die, but you figured something out. So then now you go to a di- like it, basically you keep coming back to life, right? What do you remember the name of that movie? Oh, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Edge of tomorrow, I, yeah. I, I d- live, yeah. die, repeat is I think what yeah. it is. Yeah, die, repeat. Each time, gain knowledge to Print, help die, you. I, I do feel like there is potential for that. Why'd they rename it? Because the I think because the poster had live, die, repeat bigger than the name of the movie, and everyone just was calling the movie live, die, repeat. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd say that's that's all I can think. That's of. That's what I thought it was. Oh, yeah. yeah, Live Die Repeat was way bigger than Edge of Tomorrow in any of their marketing, and it just confused the fuck out of everybody. Another really good plot, or it could even work as a setting that I would have really liked to do, is based off a movie called Poseidon. Where I never watched the movie, but it's just about a, like a huge cruise boat that gets flipped upside down. So I just think it would be really awesome to have like the characters go through the boat like as it's upside right, and then eventually you know they do something and then the boat gets flipped upside down so like that's cool i think it'd be really awesome to be able to like uh, describe a scene to you guys and then have you guys go back to that same area and then this time it's upside down i think that'd be really cool that like premise would also be a great like video game or something too right like a massive luxury cruiser in the future or something yeah yeah shane also asks what campaign was the most difficult to get through? Pokemon. Bio Sandwich. Because we didn't, we were stu- too fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah, Bio Sandwich. Actually, yeah, the ending, the original ending for Bio Sandwich maybe made you that thought, difficult to get through. You thought Pokemon was tough to get through, Casey? It was hard because Matt left. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, and I kind of stepped on the gas and, and wrapped that one. I mean, it was going to be a short season anyway, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it was, uh, Mad Max, very road. Maybe, so maybe, uh, maybe we should just say that Robbie's campaign, most recent one, was the hardest to get through because we just didn't understand any of his fucking riddles. So <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, uh, Kayla said that she understands it before you guys did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe Kayla, Robbie, and Kayla can start a podcast. 
We're just on the yeah, wrong way. Don't, don't you fuck. No, Matt, stop. You didn't know. You didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. It was fun to joke about. Don't act like you knew because we took like three episodes to find something like I couldn't tell what you guys were joking about and what you guys were serious about anymore. That's like I was always I was as I was editing. I'm just like, OK, is he joking here or is he serious? But if you looked at the map I drew, I even told you like later on, I told you guys like the oddest things are on the map, like uh, a freaking wind mill. Like, why am I like, why would I have a windmill on there? You know, I will say you had far more side quests prepared than than most people would for a campaign like that i'll say that but whatever <laughs> yeah and i yeah because i wanted to have something in every area because it didn't really make sense to not have something in an area and then like that was my fault when you guys went to the mine and you guys were all talking about leaving and then all of a sudden i just <laughs> it's just all of a sudden i just be like you hear a guy chopping wood. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of carrots on sticks there that were just leading us around. I, I mean, I think we all knew it was the wind. I mean, I knew it was the windmill. Like, as soon as I read that, like, clearly, duh. I uh, didn't know. So, but it was just, it was fun. It was fun and funny to <laughs> keep sticking what? to that, even though it was very wrong. I had no idea. I was like, we're in the cave with the wolves. So this is it. Oh, there's a well. Are you serious? Yeah. You didn't I think it was no a windmill? Idea. That's such a that's like such an obvious clue. Was that on the map? Because I barely paid attention. Yeah, the to windmill the map. was on the map. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. When when the dungeon master gives you a map, you should look at it. Uh, just to, I forgot some, about some it. Fun, I, was, I was in character the whole time. Like I don't. I've told you guys when we were off and like done recording, but I don't think the audience uh, got to hear it. But like as you guys went into the church, like the catacombs, uh, if anyone is a big Dungeons and Dragons fan and actually a dungeon master, you could tell by the loot that I gave the guys. And then when they went into the bottom uh, of the church, the catacombs, of course, the catacombs aren't really there, but they went in there and they killed like some of the heroes in the Curse of Strahd campaign that you actually you get a random uh, ally that co uh, comes with you. And everyone that was in the bottom of those catacombs, they attempted in the background story, they attempted to kill Strahd once with with Morden Caden, but Strahd turned them into vampires. And that was uh, Van Richten, Irina. And uh, a couple other of the uh, other NPCs that were down in there. You guys got all their loot. Oh, crazy. Yeah. And also, I was being a lazy DM. Like, no one, uh, like, some of the towns that you guys went to were, like, completely empty. Because I wanted, like, I didn't really want to have to play a whole bunch of NPCs. So I was being lazy. But if you guys would have ever, if you guys would have ever asked me of, like, where the NPCs were, uh, they were in... They were all basically turned into zombies. They were in that water tank that you guys went to. Those were all the civilians. So, Robbie, I, this is going to make me jump to a question from Andrew. He says, thanks for another entertaining campaign. Here are a few questions. Robbie customized a published campaign instead of starting from scratch. Did this save prep time or was it just as much work? See, that's I've, I've been thinking about this question because we got it ahead of time. And for me, I don't really think that it saved me any time just because I prep and I prepare so much. I'm a person that has to think about what I say before I say it. And then the times that I don't, I usually get myself into trouble. <laughs> but uh, I think anyone doing the Curse of Strahd campaign, if they have the campaign module book, then they're going to be set. But of course, read through the book before you do it. But as it would save me time, probably not just because I, I wanted the campaign to be also, I wanted it to be perfect. And it, I feel it was, I feel it was perfect. So I don't really think it would, have, it, I don't really think it saved me any time, but what it did help me do is really helped me set the atmosphere. Um, and that's what the book is great for. Like it gives you little hints of how to even speak and describe things. Mm -hmm. Like as your characters laying in the mud, instead of saying that, okay, you get up out of the mud, they tell you to describe it as like, as you start pushing yourself up, it feels like the mud is grasping onto your face as you stand up. So it makes everything sound creepy. They want you to, t they want you to describe things and give it like a, a, a verbiage or something that makes it sound like it's alive. Yeah, I think actually I've, I've gone through the Strahd book and I've, I've ran that campaign and I love their advice at the beginning of it for setting atmosphere and tone and things like that, especially in a horror campaign, which I had never ran before that. And I love, I don't I'm not even a horror guy myself. Horror movies give me bad dreams. I really don't like that, so I kind of avoid them. But uh, a horror D&D &D campaign, I love so much. 
I love the creepy and I love the macabre and I love just like, I love the camp. I feel like D&D is best when it's a little campy. And when you lean into that horror camp plus D&D, it really hits a sweet spot for me. So uh, another question from Andrew here. What was the point of the carpet at the beginning of the campaign? Uh, so this was something I, I cut because I was running low on time. And I'm, I'm sorry about that uh, to everybody. I should have put it in there. But uh, it was one of those things of where the dungeon master thinks that the players are going to get through it, like, you know, in five, ten minutes. But it would probably be a whole episode <laughs> if I put it in there. But uh, the point of that was if the dome at the beginning, so the dome, that dome started and it was showing you some of what was Strahd, what was inside of Strahd's castle. So then when you guys left and you came back inside of the castle and started exploring, that was going to be one of the rooms you went into. And the carpet mm. was going to grab the cat. And mm. you guys were going to have to take the carpet and like unravel the cat and then take the carpet and, and do something with it, like weigh it down or throw it into the, the fire or something. But I was like, oh, I don't really want to put that in here. Uh, toward yeah. the end of the campaign, I, I, I was starting to get burnt out and I wanted it to end, so I didn't put it in there. I do feel like I think all of us do this. Like when we know the ending is near, we're just so excited about it. And also like we've been recording for months and we just want to like wrap it up. And sometimes I feel like we're maybe a bit too, too much pushing for an ending. Yeah. I, maybe, that, maybe that's DMing, just me. No, no, I hear you. Damien's like fun. You're excited. You've got this idea. And then after a while, you want to be a player again. Uh, <laughs> and so maybe like <laughs> just, you just trim edges a little bit. I mean, you know, you, you keep everything true to what you wanted it to be, but maybe just cut some fluff. That's all. Uh, one more for Robbie here from Andrew. Tell us about the closing song. How'd that come together? I believe in the description we put Winged Few, I think, the Instagram. It's in the description if you want to try to get a hold of them. But all I did was I went on to a website, and I don't want to say the name of the website. It's just a website where you can hire freelancers. And I went on there, and this is the same guy I've hired twice for the two songs that you guys heard i've hired him my kids sang a song to for my wife for christmas and my sister has sung two songs and he's edited all of them oh, wow. so if you guys uh, want to give a nice christmas present to your wife you can sing a song and send it to this guy and he'll he'll give it to you and you can give it to your wife or have your kids sing it or say anything like that but for the the process of this one i paid extra but i gave him some of my campaign notes and things like that so i gave him strad's diary and I even put uh, a paragraph together for him of things that rhymed together to, for him to, he actually wrote this one and he did all the beats and everything. Uh, and so then basically I just sung the song. And I, well, my wife sung the song. So my wife sung it for me, which was, I think that song turned out awesome because then I told him the style that I wanted and he went and got that style. And the style I told him I wanted was like something from the eighties, like Michael Jackson thriller. And there's a monologue in the middle of Michael Jackson where a guy starts talking in like a really creepy, deep voice. Yeah. And so that was like, oh my goodness, this would be the great, like this would be so great to do the creepy voice. And I'll describe the scene where Strahd gets turned into the vampire, the male. And so then after that, I sung the rest of the song, which I think freaking worked out awesome. Do I need to any, add anything else about that? No, that's cool. I didn't know you've been using this guy so much. That's great. You're a true patron of the arts, Robbie. Yeah. So we've got two short ones here as we're starting to wrap up. One is from Jared. He says, my question is for those of us who are not fans of Apple, what is most beneficial for us to leave reviews on? I prefer podcast addict, but also use audible. Is there one that dramatically better? So um, Apple is still the best. But hey, guys, even though that crit sandwich is going going dark, uh, that doesn't mean it's going away. We are going to keep this podcast up on the Internet. Keep telling people about it. Right. This is a this is a beautiful show for binging and keep giving us iTunes reviews. That is uh, please, please, please don't stop. And honestly, the more you do that, the more you might encourage us to, to come back and, and say hello and, and do a little thing for you. We're going to figure out a way to archive the show, but not have to pay Libsyn $20 a month. Tell people about the show. Please do. If you have 
access to Apple Podcasts, please review us there. I don't know of any other places that really do a lot of reviews for podcasts, but tell a person, share us on Reddit, tell, tell your tell your Twitters, tell your Instas about your friends at Crit Sandwich, tell your, tell your D&D crew there's a pod they should binge, and we would love you forever for that. Uh, I still plan on responding, like if you have questions about something or other, and I would relay it to the guys if it's to them, but... As far as the social media goes on Facebook and stuff and email, hopefully you guys have found me pretty re- pretty responsive. Usually it's within an hour. If I mean, honestly, no, it's normally within 10 or 15 minutes I respond. So I still plan on doing that. So if you guys have questions, we have plenty of folks that have wanted like campaign notes, uh, which Casey has been always willing to share. Yeah, that kind of stuff we, we still plan on. And, and yeah, keep reviewing. It does help. And, and yeah, like Casey said, I've, you know, I wouldn't mind a reunion tour after... <laughs> <laughs> after uh um you know a good long break a hi a hiatus yeah i would say that yeah and especially if you know if people keep coming to the show you know there's there's more of a reason for us to come back to this but for now the plan is for campaign 10 to be our last and we've got one bonus question from facebook from hillary which says you guys are incredibly descriptive dudes playing D D. thank you very much hillary I've been having trouble spicing up combat. Any tips? I would say throw in some uh, things in the scene for your characters. Like you can put a chandelier on the ceiling or have some bar tables uh, like in the way. It, it all depends on your scenery. Like put something in there for them to interact with. And if a player asks you like, hey, is this in the scene? 90% of the time you want to say yes to that. That's exactly what I was about to say is that there's, you know, in, in our example, there's four people at the table, not one. Right. So having it all be on the dungeon master, I think at one point, I don't know if this was in the podcast or not, but I told Robbie he's he's working too hard um, <laughs> as a dungeon master. I, f- I feel like this is a good example as to like if you're yeah, let your players have those questions and le- let your players have these ideas and and. That that is one of the things that can make combat more fun is letting them have those ideas. And and honestly, like if they're already used to not having that, maybe start the session by saying, hey, I'm going to give you guys inspiration and I'm going to work with you on ideas. I want you to really try try some stuff this time and let's see how it goes. And, and I think they and you will be surprised at the fun stuff that they can come up with. So, yeah, just piggybacking off what. Casey said there. The other thing that both the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Player's Handbook have things for this exact scenario, rough terrain and maybe a chasm between you or things like that. I mean, you want to plan that out beforehand and have an idea of what it's going to look like so that the combat itself, then, you, you know, you give a good description and then hopefully your players can jump off that and use it. But that like as far as like status effects go and like have a good idea of what like re- definitely make sure you read the monster manual and see what all they can do because a lot of times your opponent not just the terrain and things can add to it as well. So there's just a ton of places mm-hmm. that you can get really good inspiration from as as far as you know uh, vanilla combat nobody likes that, right? Like tank and spank like in World of Warcraft where your tank runs in and everyone just DPSs it and heals. Like that's lame. No, you know, it, 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 just any wrench to make it not that is a good thing in my book. And think about the themes that you're playing with, right? Like for us, it's easy because we have movies, right? And I I generally describe the action much like I I would imagine it in that movie or or video game that we're basing the story off of. But, you know, if you're playing a horror-based campaign, get visceral with the details, right? Get uncomfortable and gross. Also know your table and your audience and whether they want that, right? But if it's based off of some sort of, you know, high-flying anime action kung fu nonsense... Keep, you know, use that, right? Think of think of what's really grounding your campaign. Is is the violence cartoony? Is it like you're not actually, you know, some tables like you probably don't really want to describe the violence, you know? You want to allude to it, but not get graphic in your details, right? Especially, you know, if it's kind of like a PG-13 fantasy adventure, you might tone it down a bit and just talk about the, the sweet moves and the, the flashes of steel. You're not going to want to talk about the... Um, you know, the spilling of organs. So Matt Mercer has a really good YouTube, like a, a YouTube playlist of like how to DM. You, like go check those things out. One thing that I've 
picked up from from what he said as my research before I DM'd my for my second time. He says that if your player like when your players start asking questions and they have something they want to do, like your job as a DM is to try to figure out what they're trying to do and help them get there. Mm -hmm. So if you're if your player wants to jump across the ceiling uh, on some four by fours and then jump down on like the boss that's on the other side of the room. If you feel your players doing that, then like help him get there. Totally. And then the other thing is too, is what I've also heard is the DM. He can set like, if you're into the high role playing, which I, I am, I like the role playing aspect of it. Then whatever you want as a DM, that's what you need to set the bar for. So if you want to like have a lot of high role playing, then you need to like possibly have your character or one of the NPCs be really into that character, character voice. The other players are going to know that you have a character voice and they're going to start doing a character voice as well. And of course, to, to describe the scene, if you're sitting mm -hmm. there at the table, you know, use your hands as you're starting to just describe things. Just use them. Like you can tell that I'm throwing my hands up right now just by my voice. Rawr. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've hit my mic while we've been recording because I'm just so like animated and swinging things around and stuff. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, those are, that's all really, really good advice, Robbie. I've learned a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we've, you know, we've grown a lot as as dungeon masters and as and as players as we've done this. You know, I think doing the short campaigns, you you learn a lot of lessons that you get to take to the next thing. Oh, definitely. My first campaign with you guys I ran was, was horrible. Oh my goodness. You know, yeah. it was it was fun, but yes, it had room for improvements for sure. Definitely, definitely. I like it's just something so horrible I put in there as was a headbutting contest. I was like, I'm doing I don't want any I don't want any more combat, although I gotta even it out. So I'm gonna put a headbutting contest in here. Uh, <laughs> not a very good idea. Especially when your player rolls to to get out of the headbutting contest. <laughs> so I think that about covers it for questions. Thanks everybody who wrote into the show. We are gonna call this the end of our QA episode, and we will be back. In a few weeks, probably mid-April, I'm thinking right about now, if not early April, with the conclusion, the season finale of Crit Sandwich. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. We love you very much. Character hidden from sight, playing a game with your life. Deep in the darkness, away from the light. A, B, or C, what's your type? Finding out soon it'll be your demise. My presence is ancient, but things diabolical. With all of this patience, my schemes are unstoppable. You may be my favorite. Escape isn't optional, there is no saviors. Defeat's only logical. I am in no rush. Quenching the bloodlust from dawn till dusk, I silence the enemy. Hush. Here's your reason to fright. I am the terror who's haunting your night. All it would take is a bite. Controlling a character hidden from sight. Playing a game with your life. Deep in the darkness, away from the light. A, B, or C, what's your type? Finding out soon it'll be your demise. I come with a storm of never-ending darkness, full of rage. As heroic as you think you are, you all are prey. Does it matter if you pray? Still, maybe your day. Party up, let's play. A love more powerful than any magic. The power is a reminder of ancient times. Strong enough to overcome a dark curse. From under the table comes sunlight. The focus on evil. A transformation begins. A contortment by death itself. <laughs> Feels the words of my diary. I made it through dark times and it's inspiring. Now I terrorize societies, dealing damage in varieties. I am the land. And 
warrior when I fell alive. Theodore had a plan, but never planned I'd take as a wife. The undead on the rise, screams of agony, delight, curse family invite. Hoping you lost in the night. Here is your reason to fright. I am the terror who's haunting your night. All it would take is a bite. Controlling a character hidden from sight. Playing a game with your life. Deep in the darkness, away from the light. A, B, or C, what you type. Finding out sooner will be your demise.